groundbreaking figure she was, not just for women. We'll just break out of that because the uh, coalition has just begun the launch of its uh, broadband policy. Uh, Here is the Malcolm, opposition leader, the Tony Abbott, and communication spokesman, Malcolm Turnbull. The 2013 election year. Uh, but before I do, uh, I should pay tribute to a giant who has passed from us overnight. Uh, Margaret Thatcher is one of the all-time greats of democratic politics. Uh, she put the great back into Great Britain. She gave Britain a future as well as a past. She was a great champion of markets, of democracies, of choice, of freedom. Uh, she inspired millions and that inspiration will live on even though she's no longer with us. So while we mourn her passing, uh, we celebrate her living. Uh, she has been a remarkable person, a great contributor to Britain, to Europe and to the wider world. But we are here today to talk about the Coalition's plans to ensure that Australians get much faster, much better, much more affordable access to broadband services in the years ahead. Our modern lives are absolutely unimaginable without access to broadband technology. I couldn't do my job without access to broadband technology. Uh, teachers, nurses, business people, uh, people at home, uh, millions and millions of Australians are using broadband every single day. And it's important that they get better broadband services than they are currently getting uh, under this government. We believe in a national broadband network and we will deliver a better national broadband network faster and more affordably than this government possibly can. Under the coalition, uh, by 2016, that's to say at the end uh, of the first term of an incoming coalition government, there will be minimum download speeds of 25 megabits uh, and up to uh, 100. So we will deliver a minimum of 25 megabits, five times average download speeds by the end of our first term. By the end of our second term, should we get one, uh, by 2019, uh, the vast majority of households will get access to 50 megabits or 10 times current speeds. Uh, we will be able to do this because we will build fibre to the node and that cost and, and that eliminates two-thirds of the cost. So we will be able to do this for under $30 billion compared to the over $90 billion that it will cost the National Broadband Network. We'll also be able to do it that much more quickly uh, because fibre to the node can be rolled out that much more quickly and that much more simply uh, than fibre to the premises. There'll also be three important inquiries under the coalition. The first will be a commercial review. It'll be completed within 60 days uh, as to how quickly the national broadband network uh, can meet our objectives. The second will be an audit of how Labor's national broadband network got into the current mess. The third will be an independent study of our telecommunications needs and in particular our broadband needs for the future and this will include a cost-benefit analysis of the Coalition's national broadband network. I'm very proud of this policy. I am confident that it gives Australians what we need. And I want to pay tribute to Malcolm Turnbull and his team. This is a very comprehensive piece of analysis. As you'll see as you go through the three uh, documents that we launched today, particularly the background paper, uh, a lot of, of work has been done. It's very high quality work indeed. Uh, it's work of a quality to surpass uh, just about anything that an opposition has previously done. Uh, I want to thank Malcolm uh, mm. and I now want to hand to him uh, to, uh, to elaborate on the policy today. Good, thank you. Thank you. I think I'll yeah. slip over. Good. Well, as Tony has said, our commitment is to, to deliver very fast broadband to all Australians sooner, cheaper and more affordably. Let me just talk about sooner first. 
It's all very well for Labor to talk about very fast broadband, but they are failing to deliver it. Their project is a failing project. They said in 2010 that they would pass 1.3 million premises with fibre by June 30 this year. Then in August last year, not very long ago, they revised all that and they said, oh no, it's only going to be 340,000 premises. Now, when it became apparent that they'd passed less than 100,000 premises uh, at the end of last year, uh, they said, oh, well, it's going slow. We now think we'll only do about 190 to 220,000 premises by June 30. Incredibly, the project has been making less progress th since January 1 this year than it was in the six months up to December 31 last year. So this project, far from ramping up, is ramping down. It is a failing project. It is also one that is going to cost a huge amount of money. Now, as you'll see, we've made a number of very conservative, very reasonable assumptions about what this project is more likely to take in terms of dollars uh, and in terms of time. And our estimate, the estimate that flows from that, is that this project will require total funding from the government of $94 billion. That is a staggering amount of money. And remember, the government has no idea how much it will cost. They've never set a limit on it. They haven't given this project a budget. They haven't said, you've got $20 billion or $10 billion and that's all you've got to work with. They've said, we'll pay whatever it costs. So just let us know how much it'll cost from time to time. It's about as crazy as going off to build a house without getting a quote from the builder and just saying, oh, just, just send me an invoice every month and I'll fix you up. That's a way to get fleeced, obviously, and that is what is happening here. So what we've looked at is the experience around the world. We've done the hard analysis that the government never did. We've looked at what telcos and governments are doing in comparable markets, in North, North America, in Europe, in Asia. And what we are presenting here is a plan that is consistent with the best practice around the world. And that will involve taking fibre to the premises in greenfield sites, in areas where there is very high demand, business centres, institutions, educational centres, hospitals, all of those places where there is high demand. But for the bulk of Australia's built up areas, residential suburbs in other words, we'll be taking fibre out into the field but not all the way into the customer's premise. And that saves about three quarters at least of the cost. And the reason it saves so much money is because the cost of this network is not in the electronics or in the fibres or in the cables, it's in labour. It's very labour intensive, digging holes and trenches and getting guys into cherry pickers and digging, you know, drilling holes in walls and all that sort of thing. So it's the civil works that rake up the cost here. So this is a much smarter approach. Now what this will deliver is speeds that are more than capable of delivering all of the services and applications households need. Because that's really the issue. It's not a question of what is your headline speed, it is what can you do with it. And the vast bulk, the, 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 the majority, substantial majority of people in the fibre to the node footprint will receive 50 megabits or more. Uh, and and very high, that's very high speeds. We have said that the minimum, the goal is the minimum to be 25 megs, but that will only be a minority. And we have not taken into account, because this has been a very conservative plan, uh, vectoring, which can dramatically increase that. And I'm happy to take some questions on that later. So all of the assumptions we've made uh, in this analysis have been conservative on looking at our proposal and, frankly, pretty generous to the governments. You could very legitimately make assumptions about the government's plan which would say it was going to cost a lot more and take even longer. Now, I want to just take you to some issues now about cost. The government is proposing that wholesale prices will treble over the next decade. And they are making extraordinary assumptions 
about the revenues that they will be able to generate for the NBN. This is one of their big flaws in their plan. They're assuming that Australians are going to pay a very substantially larger share of their uh, household income, of GDP, however you measure it, for fixed line access. There's no, there's no evidence for that at all, no justification for that at all. If you combine a more realistic approach to pricing and a less expensive network to service, you can see that broadband costs are considerably lower under the coalition. Now, this is a critical point because the biggest barrier to internet access is not technology, it's affordability. People in the lowest income percentages are far, far, far less likely to have access to the internet. You don't have to be a sociologist to work out why, it's because they can't afford it. So if you believe in everyone having internet access, you've got to make it affordable. Let me uh, take you to the next slide. This gives you an idea of how dramatic the increase in the proposed NBN uh, charges are compared uh, over their plan, and this is all set out in their corporate plan and their submissions to the ACCC. Look at the ramp in their plan in red and compare that to the notorious increase in energy bills over the last decade. So you can see we're talking about a situation where we have been getting more broadband for less dollars for a long time, for a decade. Thanks to the Labor's NBN, apparently, uh, this great benefit to the people, so they claim, we're going to see N uh, broadband costs take off through the roof. I mentioned earlier that the NBN Co has failed to meet all its targets. Well, there it is. That's what they said they would pass by fibre in 30 June 2013, as at December 2010. That's not so long ago. Then in August 12, August 2012, six months ago, <coughs> they cut that right down to 340,000. And just a few weeks ago, they cut it down again to about 200,000. Their latest figure that they've released is less than 100,000. And I, I, you've got, we've got no reason to be confident they can get to that March 2013 forecast. Now, one of the, I mentioned earlier the point about speed. This is a very critical thing to, to recognise. Speed is only valu valuable to you insofar as you've, you can use it for something. If you equip your house with one terabyte per second broadband speeds, the kind that a massive data centre might have, that'll cost you a fortune, you won't be able to do anything with it unless you dig up your garden and have the data centre there. So this is not our slide, this is from British Telecom's OpenReach, and what they're demonstrating there is what can you do with a very standard broadband speed of 40 megs, which is higher than, uh, sorry, is, is, is lower than what most of their customers can get. And as you can see, you've got multiple high-definition video streams. A high-definition video stream takes six megs. So you can, have, you can have three of them. You can have uh, multi-device browsing. So you can have, maybe you've got a big family and everyone's on their iPads, you know, engaging in all sorts of activities. You can have video chat, some gaming, and you've got plenty of uh, spare capacity. This, so this is, a, this is a critical thing to remember. It is, this is not, uh, to put this in a rather geeky way, if you'll forgive me for this, the, the value or the utility of broadband does not increase in a linear fashion with the speed. In other words, 20 megabits per second is not twice as useful or valuable to you as 10, and 40 is certainly not twice as valuable to you as 20. So that's a critical point to understand. So this is not a question of a, you know, uh, uh, Stephen Conroy has said, oh, you know, the, the government, this is, this is not as good as the government's plan. This will deliver all of the services and applications Australians want and, and are prepared to pay for online, but it will do so sooner and cheaper. And which is, that is why this approach is what's being taken around the world. Now, I just want to address one thing, just to, before we go to questions. It's a point that Stephen Conroy raised earlier today. Uh, he talked, he said, what about areas where the copper is in very poor condition? Uh, where the copper is in very poor condition, there are two approaches you can take. One is you can remediate it. 
uh, fix it up, and that is, that is something that is done all the time. And in an area, for example, where there is a lot of groundwater and the copper is, there are a lot of, a lot of problems, there are sort of endemic problems with the copper, that is an area where you may put fibre right through that uh, part of country. So you make a, you just make a rational business decision, a cost effective business decision where you go. He also raised the matter of pair gains. Now, just very briefly, what a pair gain is, is where in the past Telstra has bought a number of uh, copper lines out of its exchange to an electronic device which then multiplies those copper lines into more services. So you might have, for argument's sake, 20 coming into the electronic device and 80 going out. Uh, and he says, what about that? Well, the approach we're taking is perfect for that. It gives you a very, very quick solution. Because what you do is you pull fibre through to where the, the pair gain device was, you put in your new electronic node, and immediately all the people connected to that have got very fast broadband. So this type of technology we're talking about is, is a very, very dramatic improver uh, of people with pair gain. So that's a, apologise if that's a bit technical, but it's important to uh, get that across because there are a lot of people who have no broadband at all because they are on pair gains and because of Labor's hopelessness and inability to actually deliver anything they talk about over the last four years have seen no improvement. Let's just move over here, Malcolm. <clears throat> OK, are there any questions that people would like to ask? What do you see as the lifespan of copper in the long term? I mean, how many years can we expect this investment in the copper infrastructure or this reinvestment in the copper infrastructure to last? You haven't sort of mentioned how far forward that will take for the amount of money that you're proposing to spend. Well, well look, uh, obviously uh, all infrastructure has a lifespan. Uh, copper has a lifespan. Fibre has a lifespan. So all infrastructure does have a lifespan. All infrastructure over time has to be renewed. Uh, but there is no reason why most of the copper that's currently in place can't continue to be used. Uh, where it can't continue to be used, obviously uh, there will be a fibre rollout. Uh, where it can continue to be used, we should make use of it. One of the real problems with Labor's version of the National Broadband Network is that it junks perfectly useful infrastructure. It junks useful copper. It junks useful HFC cabling and we don't want to do this. We want to deliver people much, much faster broadband as quickly as we can, as affordably as we can and that means full use of existing infrastructure. Yeah, well, I, when I just, j j just let me add to that because I, I think I know where you're coming from. Uh, when you roll out a fibre to the node network, uh, you should always do so with a view to having the option of going fibre to the premise down the track. That might be five years' time, it might be ten years' time, it might be fifteen years' time, it might be never. But putting that additional fibre capacity into, out to the uh, fibre distribution point is, is, is very cheap to do that. So that's how you provision fibre on demand and it's how you do provision upgrades. This is, we've set this out in the background paper, uh, the economics of this, but I can assure you that we are well aware of the need to preserve your optionality and flexibility in terms of network design. But can you quantify in a number of years how long you expect the current copper infrastructure to be fit for purpose to deliver the sorts of broadband speeds that you say Australians commonly expect? Well, is it five is years? Is it ten years? No. Is it fifteen years? If this is a, the, the answer to your question is nobody knows. Copper is delivering much faster speeds today with XDSL, you know, ADSL, uh, ADSL plus, VDSL, VDSL2 plus, VDSL2 plus with vectoring. All of these technologies are delivering dramatically higher speeds. You're getting, you're getting, you know, over 100 megs uh, on the copper that you so deride. Uh, you're getting speeds that are as high or higher than what the NBN is providing over fibre. And this is not me talking. This is, you know, telcos around the world are delivering this. So the point is that in a rapidly evolving technology market with a so much disruptive change, what you should do, a prudent person, preserves as much flexibility and optionality as possible so that you can take, you make your investments to deliver the needs of your customers now and in the foreseeable future, 
preserving the flexibility to take advantage of technological developments as and when they emerge. Okay. Well, you, say, you say you've done a lot of analysis uh, for this policy. Why don't you know how long the usable lifespan of copper is? Isn't that something you'd want to know? But this is, look, can I say to you? Isn't that something you'd no, want no, to know? No, no, but <clears throat> what's the question? How long will a piece of copper last? It yes, lasts what, thousands of years. Like? You don't know. I mean, the, the physical. So you no, don't hang know on. How long it's no, usable for? No, just, just, just hang on a minute. The reality is there, there is copper in every network. There's copper in every device. There's copper everywhere in networks all around the world. The question is how long, what you're really asking is, how long will copper be the medium for the last several hundred metres between the end of the fibre and the customer's premise? And the answer is it may be a very long time, but it depends on the technological developments. Now, you may be, you may be a technological genius, and in which case, you know, we could really do with your help because I've never met anyone as clever as you appear to be because you, you think you are able to know or someone can say with certainty how, what the technology will be five and ten years hence. No, no, you don't know. Answer, well, the answer is I'm, I'm, I'm knowledgeable enough and modest enough to know that you can't predict the future with great certainty. So what you do is you build in that flexibility. Uh, and you don't, you know, when, when Labor says they've got a technology that's future proof, they are kidding themselves. Believe me, there is no technology that is future proof. That's the one, if you haven't learnt that, you've been asleep for the last 20 years. Well, no, not everyone's been asleep. Now, that's a very good leg glance, but it's quite nonsense. However, you said in announcing the policy you will commence a commercial review that will have 60 days to work out how quickly your national broadband network plan can be rolled out. You also announced that it will be rolled out by 2016. Please, can we have those two aims resolved? You can't know that you'll deliver it by 2016 if you need a commercial review to tell you. Well, let me, let me take that question. I can answer that. What we have made is what we've got here is a policy that is very realistic, that we have researched very carefully, that we've discussed with people very knowledgeable in the field, people that are actually building new generation broadband networks, both here and internationally. So we haven't spent a lot of time, we spent some time with academics, we've actually spent time with the men and the women that are really doing the work, that really know what they're talking about. They're the people I'd encourage every journalist here is interested in this area to talk to. They are the most knowledgeable people. Now, we believe the goals here are very realisable. But what we are going to do, as Tony has said, immediately the NBN Co will set out it a realistic, objective assessment of how long it is going to take in dollars and time to complete, complete the project on the current trajectory, on the current design, and then set out what savings can be achieved both in dollars and time, by making changes of the kind that we've proposed. And indeed, there are some other changes, because we didn't want to over-complicate our proposal. There are other changes of a much more technical nature that can also make some considerable savings. So, so that is the and, that, and the... and the point of that is that that will be... have the benefit of all of the NBN's experience and have access to that information. So and I, I'm very confident that that will uh, confirm the reasonableness of what we've proposed. And the 2016 um, target. Just the gentleman here with the camera. Uh, can, can the coalition confirm whether it's planning to make a return on investment from its $29.4 billion spent? Well, what we're going to do is we are going to invest the money up to the $29.5 billion. Uh, we believe that that is what it will take uh, to get the national broadband network uh, up and running and ready for sale. Uh, we think that what we've got in mind is necessary to rescue the national broadband network, which, uh, as Malcolm has said, uh, as uh, shrewd observers like Henry Ergas have published, is currently on the point of collapse. Hang, hang on, just, just once. I just want to add something to that. This is a, a very important point. The, the revenues that the coalition NBN will be able to generate will be substantially the same, certainly no less than, the revenues the Labor NBN would be able to generate. And if you doubt me on that, 
as we've set out in the background papers, you can look at the, the tech test case, if you like, between AT&T's fibre to the node deployment and Verizon's fibre to the premises deployment in the United States, where the average revenue per user is essentially the same. And of course, one network cost a third to a quarter of the to build and, and than the other. So the, the ARPUs will be very comparable in reality, and that's the, that, that is why our proposition, our approach, is much more, much more likely to generate a positive return, let alone a commercial one. John McDoolan. Yes. Uh, so just to confirm, the funding remains off budget? Well, it? It, it's, it's off budget only in the sense that the investment doesn't go through the expenditure portion of the... Um, you know, the, the budget statements that, that, that we all focus on that deliver uh, deficit or surplus. The, the public sector accounting treats this as a balance sheet item and, and we don't have any plans uh, to change that. And that's, that's because it is a commercial investment. Now, our, our argument on this point has been that the, it is so plainly obvious that the amount of money the government is investing in this project is so far in excess of what the value of the project will be when completed that they should be recognising the deficit uh, in, 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 it, it, in some manner. Now, whether you recognise that through the budget uh, in, the, you know, in the way you would in a private sector company through taking a loss through the P&L is another question. But we're not proposing to change the, the budget treatment of this. We, we, we think, John, that uh, our NBN is a commercial proposition Labor's NBN is not a commercial proposition. The other point I should make is that obviously there will be some savings to the budget because it won't be borrowing mm, nearly as much. Uh, we estimate, uh, uh, depending upon the, um, the interest rate assumptions, uh, we, we estimate about $750 million of savings over the forward estimates period. Have you set a timeline or, or plan for, for selling the Coalition's NBN down the track? Well, um, just as the government has said that eventually its NBN <clears throat> would be returned to the private sector, uh, ours certainly uh, ultimately will go back into the private sector, but it won't go into the private sector until it's ready for sale. Uh, at the moment, there is nothing to sell. What we need to do is produce an NBN which is saleable. If we are going to have the sort of respect for taxpayers that we need, We've got to produce something which is saleable. It's not entirely an exaggeration, <coughs> given the uh, dreadful state this project is in and the time it'll take to get it fixed up. Uh, it's not entirely an exaggeration to say that its return to the private sector could be a high priority for Wyatt Roy's second term as Prime <laughs> Minister. You have to renegotiate the agreements with Telstra. Can you confirm that Telstra shareholders would be no worse off under this? Sorry, I'm just saying that again. You'll have to renegotiate the agreements with Telstra to get access. Yeah, well, there, yeah, absolutely. There, there would have to be some re renegotiation with Telstra. We're very confident that can be achieved uh, speedily, and uh, we've set out the rationale for that in the in the policy documents. Would Telstra shareholders be affected? Would they be no worse off? Look, we we understand and respect the need for Telstra shareholders to be kept whole in the sense that Telstra is not going to do any deal if their shareholders are worse off. Uh, the approach we're taking. Will, is, is not bad news for Telstra. It's, it's actually marginally, they'll be marginally better off, is what many analysts think. I noticed uh, one of the broker's analysts said today that uh, this approach would be, will be add, I think, three cents to the value of a Telstra share. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's somewhere between a neutral and a, and a mild positive. But certainly Telstra shareholders have got nothing to fear from our approach. And, and, the, in, and the interesting thing, if I may add, is that um, Telstra only gets paid mm. under the government scheme uh, mm. when uh, the NBN connection becomes live. Uh, and there are very few live NBN connections mm. right now. Under us, uh, the thing will become operational vastly more quickly, uh, mm. so Telstra will start to get some money. What happens to the Optus Agreement? Yeah, we've, we've not assumed any change to the Optus Agreement uh, at all, so we, we've assumed that, that remains where it is. Um, Optus's agreement, as you know, essentially relates to their HFC. Everything we've heard from Optus indicates that they've, you know, they, they want to be out of the HFC. So we've assumed out of an abundance of caution, and this is a very, the assumptions, as you'll see, are very conservative and prudent ones. 
We've just assumed no change to that. Will you require, require Telstra and Optus to open up their HFC uh, networks to wholesale? The what we've set. Do you mind if I just? Yeah, sure, mate. This, this is getting into the yeah. into the footnotes. Uh, the uh, uh, what we've what we've said in terms of uh, HFC networks is that were we to change the agreements with Telstra and Optus, which, as you know, basically require them to switch off. It's a shockingly anti-competitive agreement, by the way, which we've criticised extensively, as I'm sure you remember. But uh, what, what the agreement says is that once a premise is connected to the NBN, uh, then Telstra and, Op Telstra and or Optus cannot provide broadband services over their HFC. Now, that is extremely anti-competitive. It flies in the face of government policies in this country and every other country for several generations. Uh, but it is, that is the agreement. We would like to unwind that and actually enable uh, facilities-based competition. But as we say in the document, we could only do that in circumstances where competition was enhanced, open access to that particular customer and market were preserved. So that is a, that, that, you know, that's something that has to be negotiated. But it is a, you know, I, I can assure you, we, we find the approach of the NBN, the government of the NBN, quite extraordinary. This is, this is a very important thing for all Australians to, to recognise. This policy is unique in the world. There is no government, not in China, not in, any, not in North Korea as far as I'm aware even, that is actually building a new government-owned telecom monopoly and prohibiting uh, anyone from competing with it. I mean, it is in every other country in the world where broadband networks are being built, governments seek to promote uh, competition. And that, of course, was, you know, that, that was Labor policy, it was our policy. So this approach of a, of a great big new government-owned telecom monopoly is, is going back to the economics, truthfully, of the 1950s. This is, this is skipping several generations, not just from the point of view of Tony's and my party, but from the point of view of the Labor Party. This is not... Paul Keating and Bob Hawke would never have done this. Who will, can, who will be doing the in independent review? Who are you commissioned to do that? And will you abide it, by any recommendations they make if they conflict with your policy? Look, it, it, it will be a fully independent review. Uh, it may be the Productivity Commission, although we're conscious of the fact that the Productivity Commission has a very heavy workload. Uh, it may be Infrastructure Australia, but one way or another, there will be a full independent review of telecommunications going forward, of broadband going forward, uh, and that will obviously include a cost-benefit analysis, a published cost-benefit analysis of our version of the National Broadband Network. But when you do a cost-benefit analysis of, of Labor's NBN, because Mr Turnbull, you hinted at it at the Kickstarter conference earlier this year, so will you do a cost-benefit analysis the, of, the, uh, the, of the, the big NBN? Look, the big, uh, the big question, yeah, the, the, the answer is yes, all of that will be examined. But you know, one of the yeah yes the yeah the answer is yes. The the big question uh, that needs to be answered is is this. While we all accept there are very significant benefits from everyone having access to very fast broadband, that's why affordability is so important mm -hmm. in our policy, uh, and such a problem lack of affordability is such an issue for Labor. While we accept there are great benefits. There is a real issue as to how much benefit is there, for example, uh, in taking everybody from, say, 50 megs to potentially 150 or, or, or a gig. And, and you know, the, 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 the better view, uh, and I, I, I've got very little doubt an inquiry would, would make this conclusion, the view around the world is that utility tends to flatten out. Uh, because as you go higher and higher, the things you can do with that speed are less and less in a residential environment. And this is where, of course, you know, our fibre on demand product is so valuable. So that if you have, if you imagine everyone in this uh, studio is a house in a residential suburb and we roll out the fibre to the node uh, proposal, you know, most people have got you know, 40, 50 megs or better. You know, they might, let's say there's a few people that have got 25 and a bit more, and, and everyone's happy with that. But there is one chap there who's an architect, and he 
has a practice in Shanghai and he's working from home and he's uploading and downloading huge files. Well, what, what you can do is say, all right, we will run a fibre to you. You give us a few thousand dollars. This is what they do in the UK, a few thousand pounds there. And then that person has got, you know, one gig symmetrical if they like. Now, that might be the only person in that suburb that actually needs it. But the good thing about this technology, this technological approach, is that it's very flexible. Now, if, on the other hand, you go to the local commercial park or industrial park, corporate park or something, well, of course you run fibre into there because you've got lots of customers wanting a lot of bandwidth. So it's a very, it, it, this is very flexible. And th th by the way, all of these things I'm talking about now, whether it is fibre on demand, whether it is vectoring, were not in reality available, in some cases not even uh, contemplated, when fibre to the node was last looked at seriously in this country five or six years ago. And just, if, and just if I may add something, I mean, at 25 megs, you can uh, simultaneously be downloading uh, four uh, HDTV programs. So uh, you can have four people in four different parts of the standard house uh, watching the sport, a movie, uh, whatever you might be doing. Uh, so we are absolutely confident uh, that 25 megs is going to be enough more than enough for the average household. Let's examine Telstra as a dependency for, you, for the commencement of your project <coughs> in getting a start date some point after a September 2013 election and a target, uh, and a target for uh, 2016. You're taking a very optimistic assumption about how quickly you can deal with what is, among other things, as well as being our incumbent carrier, a company that is one of the biggest law firms in Australia. They have managed to delay everything, every initiative that has been attempted since about 1996. Well, can I make a few observations before throwing to Malcolm? First of all, we aren't interested in going to war with Telstra. Uh, and I think that's one of the problems that we've, that we've, that we've, that we've seen. Uh, too much conflict between government and Telstra in the past. Uh, we want to work constructively and collegially uh, with Telstra and the other telcos. That's the first point to make. The second point to make is that um, rolling out fibre to a few thousand nodes is obviously a vastly less daunting engineering undertaking than rolling out fibre to some 12 million households. That's why we are very confident that our NBN is deliverable in a way that Labor's NBN obviously is not. Look, to give you, to give you an example in terms of speed, um, British Telecom will pass 19 million households. <coughs> 19 million households. Yes, they are in, just, a year later just, than just, their first just, in 2009. Just, if you could model your civility on the rest of the journalists present. Ah, yeah. no, about, about, oh, all right. British Telecom okay, we'll take another question later, from someone. You, sir. Late by its own time we'll take time. someone else. Yeah, actually, can, can, I, can I just correct that, gentlemen? Look, you, yes, they have. what you said mm -hmm. is completely wrong. No, British they Telecom's to 2014 no, no, date in 2009. Please, please. Now announce a 2015 please. date to reach 60 per cent. Well, you are. British Telecom is running ahead there. Uh, I mean, I talk to British Telecom all the time, and my research with British Telecom is based on talking, as it is with most of these telcos, talking to the people that are actually doing the work rather than reading bulletin boards and blogs. And I promise you, I promise you, they are that right now they are passing 100,000 premises a week and they will do 19, pass 19 million premises in three and a half years. Now in four years, in four years, the Labor Party has pa hasn't passed 100,000 premises. Please. Um, Mr Turnbull, you're right. British, well, Telecom, uh, British Telecom is doing that. But, and, and really it's only globally incumbent telcos like British Telecom that has been able to do that. You, the Coalition has made a great deal of the fact that the Australian Government is the only government globally to be rolling out fibre to the home. But won't the Co Coalition Government be the only government rolling out fibre to the node globally? Uh, if I can answer that, Tony. Look, you, the, the answer is, uh, answer is you are, you're right, you know. But I tell you, we are, we are in the position of the... Uh, guy that is uh, going touring in Ireland and gets lost in one of those little country lanes and uh, goes into the Irish pub and asks for directions. And the barman, with the generosity and helpfulness uh, and uh, uh, kindness for which the Irish are famous, says to him, well, sir, if I were you, I wouldn't be starting from here. 
and the truth is we wouldn't be starting from here either. So uh, we are the the government shouldn't be building this. Every other country in the world that I can think of uh, has taken the approach of getting the industry, the private sector, to do it and provided some degree of subsidy for the non-commercial, non-economic areas. That was a choice the government should have taken. It was actually was their original policy, remember, in 2007. Uh, they abandoned this for this great scheme. So Tony and I are inheriting the NBN Co, uh, but we're not you know, we're not about, uh, you know, just moaning and groaning about the bad decisions made preceding it. What we are going to do is get this job done, and we will bring very fast broadband to all Australians sooner, cheaper, and more affordably. We would not have gone about it this way, and there will be billions of dollars that Labor has wasted that we cannot recover. But we will save many billions of dollars, at least $60 billion by taking the approach that we've described in this policy. Yeah, and could I just say in, in conclusion uh, that uh, I do want to urge all of you uh, to read the documents that we've released today, particularly the background paper, which is a very comprehensive document and, as you will see from it, uh, a verily, very thoroughly researched document. But I, I also want to say that uh, uh, you've heard today from a Shadow Minister for Communications who is obviously on top of this subject in a way that the Minister for Communications clearly isn't. Uh, Malcolm was one of Australia's <coughs> internet pioneers as one of the founders of Aussie Mail and I'm confident that in the years to come uh, Malcolm is going to be Mr Broadband uh, and that an incoming coalition government can finally bring Australia into the broadband world, into the digital world. I'm very confident that we can do that and I'm very proud to be associated with this policy this morning. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thanks, well Tony. Done, mate. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Just give, given the building we're in, just a couple of sporting questions, please. A couple of sporting questions. <laughs> all right. right. Um, just one or two. Yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. 